Often, when we think of folk tradition, the first thing that comes to mind is quote unquote old stories. So, folk tales, wonder tales, Shkelta Gashke, Shihanachas, supernatural legends, and so on, along with the folk custom and popular belief. But the landscape of tradition is much broader than that, uh, and memories of local and national historical events, as recounted by ordinary people, also comprise a large and an important element of the collections here at the National Folklore Collection in University College Dublin. A series of over 700 tape-recorded interviews made with Dublin people in 1979 to 1980 contain vivid contemporary accounts of the 1916 Easter Rising, the 1919 to 1921 Irish War of Independence, and of the events leading to the Irish Civil War. So, and it's these um, topics we're going to explore today. You're welcome to episode 34 of Blurini Belladish, the podcast from the National Folklore Collection. I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague here at the NFC, Abba van der Heide, who listeners may remember from episode 26 of Blurini, which involved a discussion around Abba's research concerning seals in folk tradition. What Abba? Garmar. It's nice to be back. Happy out. So today, um, like I mentioned, we're going to look at material concerning the Irish War of Independence. And we're going to play lots of audio that you've been working on, these kind of tape recordings. And we're, we're doing that really because as the occasion, the 6th of December 2021 marks the 100 year anniversary of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The events leading up to the sign, signing of the treaty were marked by hundreds of years of conflict and violence. And Ireland has had a very long, complex and often tumultuous history with its nearest neighbour, Britain, with many invasions, wars, colonisations, confiscations, battles, burnings and sieges taking place here for over 800 years. The Anglo-Norman invasion of 1169, the failed revolt of Silicon Thomas in 1534, the ruling of the island by uh, England's monarchs with the creation of the Kingdom of Ireland in 1542, the Nine Years' War of 1594-1603, the Ulster Plantation in 1609, land confiscations under the Act of Settlement in 1652, the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, the Rising of 1798, the Act of Union in 1801, which saw Ireland ruled directly from London, to name a few. Yes. And so in the 19th century in particular, in Ireland was a period of great disturbance and upheaval. So we have the Great Famine of 1845 to 1852, which led to the deaths of millions through starvation and disease, while millions more emigrated for Britain and the New World of the Americas. And this event kind of might be seen as marking a great fault line in the Irish psyche. So the island's population being halved by the 1890s, which is kind of incredible to think, really. The 19th century also saw the emergence of nationalist and separatist groups such as the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which strove for an Irish Republic, and its aims had melded and meshed with the artistic and cultural movement that was the Gaelic Revival. And the figures in the Revival looked to our native arts, literature, music, poetry, and sports as a source of national revivification and pride. Uh, at the same time as well, we saw the rise of the Land League under Parnell and Dabbitt, which strove to abolish landlordism in Ireland and to assist the plight of poor tenant farmers. The Irish Home Rule movement gathered strength in the late 19th, late 19th and early 20th centuries, being discussed in the British Parliament. And in 1905, Arthur Griffith established Sinn Féin, which means ourselves alone, or we ourselves, uh, which strove for the establishment of a parliament in Dublin. Amongst the Protestant majority in Ulster, however, Home Rule and separation from the Union with Britain was strongly opposed, and they believed that Home Rule meant Rome Rule, i.e. that the Catholic Church would rule the country. In 1912, the Ulster Covenant was signed. In 1913, the Ulster Volunteers were formed. The Irish Volunteers were formed in response, and the country was on the brink of civil war. The Home Rule Bill passed through British Parliament in 1914, but the outbreak of the First World War uh, saw its implementation suspended as the Great War rolled on. Huge numbers of Irish Volunteers signed up to fight in the British Army in the First World War. Others stayed behind to secretly plot the, rising, the Easter Rising of 1916. The leaders uh, then signed, the leaders of the Rising signed the Proclamation of Independence. They captured key strategic points around Dublin. A conflict, enormous conflict broke out across the city and Dublin was shelled by British forces and portions of the inner city were razed to the ground and many civilians were killed. The leaders surrendered and were executed in May of 1916. And while the Easter Rising wasn't a popular revolt as such, the response of the British, along with the threat of Irish conscription into World War I, led to a sort of a hardening of attitudes and the rising sentiment and sympathies behind the martyred leaders of the Rising. So many of those who had fought in the Rising were imprisoned in Frangach in Wales, one of whom was the corkman Michael Collins, who we'll hear of later on throughout these recordings. Collins rose to lead rebel forces and engage crown forces and their outposts, patrols and barracks in guerrilla warfare and ambushes and raids. In 1918, Sinn Féin won a landslide victory in Ireland. 
but instead of taking their seats in Westminster, they held on January 21st, 1919, the first meeting of Dáil Éireann, which took place at Dublin's Mansion House, where an independent Irish Republic was declared. Have you seen the photograph of that? No, I haven't. It's amazing. There's an amazing picture of them all sitting at the city. Owen McNeil is there. Oh. So Owen McNeil is the great kind of um, Celtic studies scholar. His He was also the father of the great Maura McNeil, who mm-hmm. worked here at the Arts Folklore Commission. He, the, she was the worked at the in the archive and was the author of um, the Festival of Lunacy. But it's an, an incredible photograph of these kind of luminaries, basically. But oh, they're yeah, all kind of Galran. Check it. You can see it online. It was on January 21st, 1919. The same day, in Solohead Beg, in Tipperary and Munster, Irish volunteers ambushed and killed the, a, a Royal Irish Constabulary, an RIC patrol, and took all their weapons. It was a load of gelignite. And with this ambush, the first shots of the Irish War of Independence had been fired. Um, so this is a kind of incredibly brief uh, overview or context to some of what you're, what you're going to hear. Um, so we're going to play a baby about 10 or 12 recordings. Yep. How did you come to work with these initially? So a long time ago at this point, it feels like, but when I was still a student uh, in the Masters of Irish Folklore and Ethnology... Many moons ago. Many moons ago at this point, I was doing a three-week internship here in the National Folklore Collection and our director, Dr. Christo McCorhig, suggested, in light of the um, decade of centenaries and of the commemorations mm-hmm. that were to come at that point, um, that I begin to comb through uh, material from uh, the Urban Folklore Project mm. to search for any mention of the War of Independence, of Black and Tans, of um, anything relevant to the time period of 1919, 1920, 1921, mm. so that we could use them later. Mm-hmm. As it happens, it is currently later. <laughs> um, and we've re- returned to them kind of periodically over the last one or two years. But um, as you mentioned earlier, we're, we're fast approaching uh, December mm-hmm. uh, 6th. Mm-hmm. Yeah, December 6th, the um, 100 year anniversary of the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Um, so we wanted to mark, mark, mark with that the, yeah. occasion with... Um, by sharing some of these really fascinating pieces with you. They are, they are fascinating. And it's the same. I had done something similar around the centenary of the 1916, mm-hmm. the Easter Rising. Exactly. Um, and this is something we were chatting about yesterday in the context of kind of sometimes the archival collections that we come to work with here for the purposes of either kind of exhibitions or presentations or anniversaries and dates and things like that. They're not necessarily... Um, say topics that i would have been immediately drawn to say no in the context of like looking at military history or something like that it wasn't a topic that i wanted to like oh i must i was always interested more in i don't know material regarding the other world and kind of um different aspects of popular belief and custom and narratives and so on but so when i when i got a list of these recordings from 1916 and they've been transcribed and uploaded if you go to uh, ucd.ie forward slash folklore forward slash 1916 you'll be brought to a website with the transcriptions and the audio but the top by the time I was done with it I just I was just utterly gripped and fascinated mm-hmm. by these recordings because unlike I suppose this is this is the this is the one of the, the the characteristics of the traditional archive unlike the formal say archival records that might be found concerning military history or combatants or belligerents or who was where and what are the official records of the movements of troops and so on what you get in these recordings are accounts of the everyday ordinary people who get caught up often in, in these um, huge historical events. So again, it's the popular view. It's what is the ordinary man or woman on the streets perspective of what happened in the context of the 1916 recordings. It's like there's one occasion where um, a woman is taking a neighbor's baby for walking the pram and she gets wrapped up yes, in the whole thing. I remember that one. Yeah. Um, so even in, in items that you're maybe not necessarily drawn to, immediately out of your own personal interest often by the time you've worked with them they offer these fascinating insights yeah i felt the same working with this there are so many so many interviews that are just fascinating from beginning to end and mm. um, that it was difficult to narrow them down in the end so to pick these kind of short edited clips but um, and what is the i don't know it's worth maybe explaining a bit to people who aren't aware what was the urban folklore project yeah now the urban folklore project was a really a wonderful scheme it 
took place from 1979 to 1980 um, and it was funded by FOSS as an employment scheme for graduate students at the time mm. um, due to the economic depression. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. One of many. One, yes. Um, but um, Dr. or Professor Seamus O'Cahan was the um, director of the scheme and then I think there was uh, about 15 students employed graduate students employed under the scheme five of them were graduates of the department of irish folklore mm. and then 10 from other uh, various academic uh, backgrounds and mm-hmm. um, the five who are in who are had a background in irish folklore they were kind of given a role of supervisor and uh, were involved in training the other the other students in interviewing skills mm-hmm. those kind of things that would be needed and they also were given the task of adapting uh, the Handbook of Irish Folklore by mm. Shana Sudawan for these purposes. For use in an urban context. That's exactly. I did not know that. Right. So they had to kind of adapt the subjects and the... Con- and the Exactly. Because, I mean, the Handbook is an amazing resource and we, we draw on it, I would say, every day yep. here. Yeah. Um, it really works as a key to um, the, the archive, archive. Yeah. but may not be totally ready for... An, an urban kind an of context. Urban context. Well, it's full of amazing biases. So, Handbook of Irish Folklore, that's the book that the this, this system here in the traditional archive of all the subject topics and, and so on is devised, is based. But in it, you have these amazing quotes from there's, there's a foreword to the, to the, um, uh, to the book by Delarge, Seamus of Delarge, who was the, the founder of the Irish Folklore Commission and the Folklore Royal Society and the Irish Folklore Institute, kind of a bit of a genius. But here's a quote from the handbook and from his introductory note to it. He says, The entire fabric of Irish rural civilization, so well portrayed in the present volume, is today, as in the past, beset by many enemies. Here, as elsewhere, the shoddy, imported culture of the towns pushes back the frontiers of the indigenous homespun culture of the countryside. And the ancient courtesies and traditional ways of thought and behaviour tend to disappear before the destroying breath of the spirit of the age. <laughs> I love that quote. Yeah. It's a sandwich altogether. Um, but what you see, and I suppose what's, what's part and parcel really of the work of the commission is a really strong rural bias. Um, you have, even in, in O'Sullivan's instructions to collectors, he says, so the main purpose of this book is to serve as a guide for collectors of Irish oral tradition. There are very few people living in Ireland who are not tradition bearers to some extent. Even city and town-born individuals possess traditional information concerning the ways and doings of those about them. It is in country districts, however, that information is to be obtained in the greatest abundance. So, that's where the commission focused its efforts for the earliest kind of or earlier phases of its of its inception. And O'Cahan had recognised this kind of blind spot, this gap in the collection, and so he instituted the Urban Folklore Project specifically to focus on and interview people in inner city Dublin in mm-hmm. urban areas and also inner city urban uh, parts of Cork and so on to look at life, customs, practices, traditions of urban city dwellers and it's it, there are over 700 tape recordings uh, yes. conducted as part it's a fascinating it's a fantastic co- yeah. collection and not only recordings but also photographs photographs there's yes so good point photographs. thousands of photographs yeah. um, a lot of them are available on dukas.ie so do go have a look mm. um, but photographs of the city kind of before Really big changes came into Before the city. Before it became one giant hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the photographs really are worth looking at. Um, they took videos of school children playing games. Mm. And then I think also of mummers as well mm-hmm. um, in swords. Yeah, there's um, amazing sounds, even market sounds. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and children's game sounds yeah. and all that sort of stuff. And, and footage yeah, of, of kids playing. Um, so... Just I suppose so. That's the context of the collection that we're that you're going to hear this that we're going to kind of go through these these accounts. They were recorded from people in 1979 and mm-hmm. 1980, but many of those people either took part in the Easter Rising, or took part in the War of Independence, or took part in the Civil War, or were simply bore witness to parts of the Easter Rising, parts of the War of Independence, and parts of the Civil War. And for this episode, we are focusing on accounts concerning the War of Independence. Mm-hmm. So is there any particular piece that you want to look at to start, to kind of to start to begin, off? Um, I thought we would begin with Tom Merrigan, as he talks about one of the earlier instances in the, the War of Independence. He talks about, he describes the raid that his company made on the Collinstown Aerodrome in 1919, so the place where Dublin Airport is today. So Tom Merrigan is from Drimna mm-hmm. uh, in, in Dublin. The audio 
I don't know what is happening at the beginning of the audio, but it's very soft. Oh, um, it's kind of uh, it's poor quality at the start. So yeah. I presume after twenty seconds, maybe the mic gets moved closer Shoved to him or something face. like that. Um, so it does get clearer after that. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, shall we give him a listen? I'm in the volunteers up to nineteen thirty six. Right. In nineteen nineteen, we made a raid on the Collinstown Aerodrome. Right. That's where Collinstown is now. Right. The airport there. Right. On that particular occasion, the the British were building an airport there for themselves, a military airport. Right. Right. It was a guard of 21 British troops on it, you know. But in any case, the raid was going to take place about 11 o'clock at night. Now they had everything worked out where the guard was placed, where the the uh, Sentries were and all that time, time they were changed and all that. Right. And they said around 11 o'clock at night was the, t- the right time to attack. Right. <coughs> but uh, on the way out of the yard, around the cars were all down. Right. The result was that we didn't arrive there until about 2 in the morning right. instead of 11 at night. But the guard room was a sort of an oblong affair. And the sentry was supposed to be walking up and down outside, inside of a war compartment, you know. And there was another building on this side here, about five or six yards away from the guard room. And we were able to make our way up to that. And my, my job that time was, I had an uncle in the British Army and he was home on leave. And he had a khaki uniform. And I got around to that. Harry uniform and dressed up and I was to take the rifle when the sentry was knocked out, <laughs> take his place. And we got to the the corner of the building where we had the guard room under observation. And we were just peeping around the corner to see the sentry walking up and down. We were there for about a quarter of an hour and there was no sentry. There was no sign of a sentry at all. So there was a hurry confab between Paddy Houlihan and Paddy Breslin, mm-hmm. and they decided to rush the guard room. Now there was two doors in the guard room, there was one here and one opposite on the far side. And so they decided to, to rush them both. Anyway, we did that. Rushed the guard room from both sides and got in. And there was no sentry at all. They were all asleep on the floor. <laughs> Complete guys was to see. Anyway, our hardest job was to wake them up and tie them up. I took all the rifles, 72 rifles on, all that equipment and ammunition we could lay our hands on. That was all taken. Of course, you needless to say that they were all sacked the next day. And the air is wrong. Was the British Army Aerodrome was lying there for years, and they never did any more with it. But until the airport took it over, Collinstown it was then. Anyway, we got away with the so successfully. What year was that again? That was 1919. Around March 1919, it was. So that's Tom Merrigan there from from um, Brandon Road and Drimna chatting to Jared Brady in uh, 1980 and he's talking about their engagement in 1919 at Collins Aerodrome. Um, you have another piece from Tom Merrigan yeah, here? Yeah, we just he speaks about, he had three sisters and they were in Common and Man and so he speaks about um, some of the roles that they played within Common and Man. And Common and Man was, was a women's organisation basically. That's right. Um, and they were extremely active at, at this time as well. Afterwards, did you have any brothers or anybody that got involved? The three sisters, they were all arrested, yeah. different times, they were all in common on mine, you know. Right. Um, what type of work did, would they do in the common? The common on mine? Mm. Oh, they, they used to, to do propaganda work, mostly. Um, and they carry guns for you. Okay. You know, after sort of, uh, they showed up somewhere, they'd be convenient and you'd just pass them over and they'd bring them back to the dumps and that. Right. And 
But and of course they knew first aid. Right. And there were dab hands of paint and slogans on the lippy wall and right. different other buildings around the city, usual thing you see nowadays. Right. Was there a wide range in ages in the women in coming them on? Or were they a lot of young people? Right? Uh, there was a lot of young people in it. Mm. Then there was a lot of uh, younger, because they used to call Clanny Gale. Right. They were younger, and they used to, some of them used to come to come them on right. as they grew up, you know. But a lot of gun running and stuff of this was, was part of the, the, the work of coming them on. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the tra their training, like they had, you know, because guerrilla warfare, that was how this, this kind of played out, really. It wasn't in, in kind of open war against the might of the British Army, it was guerrilla warfare. It was people melting back into the civilian landscape in this kind of impossible task i suppose to try mm. and to try and really find or point to the enemy basically which involved many then then kind of civilian casualties and ways as well mm. and uh, reprisals and so on that we'll see later especially from the auxiliaries and the black and tans and so on um what's the next piece that you have to to well actually since how you just mentioned the idea of, of weapons and guerrilla warfare we might actually go straight to uh, Seamus Murray here. So um, again, he was recorded in 1980, but he talks a little bit about how the IRA sourced their weapons. And again, uh, a lot of them came from the British Army. And he explains, he goes into more detail about that. Um, but also he, he explains as to why some weapons were more useful to others outside the city. They go down to it, if anyone brought in munitions, you know, loyalists to the crown, right. like this. Right. Now, like that, and when that fellow's coming home from France, bringing home the rifle, right. and this is how we got in touch with these. The numerous raid made on different barracks and things like that, right. in place, you see, and started to arm ourselves with their weapons, right. you see, like that. That kept going on continuously, like that. Where would you leave the weapons when you got them from the police? Where would I leave what? The weapons that you collected in that way. The we oh, the, whoever the, the company quartermaster would be, mm. he'd have them. Then you, you paid for your own rifle. You paid your weekly subscriptions, mm. you see. You bought your own uniform. Well, we'd look at me books and see who would, who would have paid the most mm. money. I right, know they come to my house. Mm. We come with a shovel, we come with a spade. Mm. And put it on that, leave the house with it. You know, the rifle there. Never took them a son. You couldn't take the, you couldn't take the butts off of the house rifles. They were too long, you know. But there wasn't such a terrible lot of them, you see. But uh, they didn't them fight. On one occasion, an other came out that all rifles and all of that was to be evacuated from the city. They were of no use in the city for guerrilla warfare. Because you couldn't carry a rifle as a citizen, you know. A fella there, they were like, you and me carrying a rifle, you'd be noticed at once. Right. The police and spies and all that. Uh, the they were only useful to the men on the run. The guns that the cycle battalion collected, they were given to the quartermaster, were they? Now, the, 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 you see, they sat building up, mm. but they hadn't much in it when I went into it. Right. See, Now, I didn't hold anything in there. It was just one of the two men of my company, the other man, you see. But then you see, the, it started to get bigger then. You know, and then they'd go around to different houses. If they heard there was arms, they'd just go in and pretend they were from the British forces and they were getting the, any of those rifles at all mm. and that uh, they didn't want them to fall into the hands of the IRA. Mm. And a lot of those things were handed over. Most of them just handed over. Mm. Then our fellows were armed with the like of this, mm. armed themselves like that. Mm. But I wasn't at that. I was put on then onto munitions. And it was this that I'd be gone then. I used to go to a, sh I used to go to a shop in Parnell Street, in the corner of Denmark Street. Mm. Coogan's was the name. A lot of them, I don't know whether they knew that I was used to. Well, I'd go in there and i get a box of grenades. I think it was a box of sweets. Mm. But there were empty grenades, nothing in them. Mm. I'd bring them to Dendelein. Mm. And then, of course, the men who knew how to do this, you know, making up the grenades. Because at first there was there were tin cans and things like that, you see. That was the difficulty. That was fascinating, listening to that. And again, even the sense of like, that it's not open war, that it's a kind of, you have this mm. illusion of normality on the street. 
and so as such rifles are nearly useless as he says except for the except for you know those who are on the run because you'll be spied and seen immediately yeah. and it's just some land going down the road with a rifle yeah. and yet they needed to arm themselves i remember in, in material regarding the 1916 um uh, the, the rising then the description of uh, rifles or weapon guns being being hidden on the clotheslines oh. and put out between streets so you know, have a clothesline between buildings yes. and they would be put out on the lines with shirts over them and so if oh, there was a raid yeah. in the house that they'd be and then you get a sense again so he's going into this sweet shop and he's buying these kind of grenade casings and then he's walking with this his box of sweets to mm. all appearances to some other part of the city where men know how to you know fill those grenades and yeah. make them kind of viable or live or whatever so there's a kind of network across the city that's operating under the very watchful eye of the police and spies everywhere. And intelligence had a huge part, I suppose, to play in, in the War of Independence from both sides, like from, from double agents and spies and so mm-hmm. on. The Dublin Metropolitan Police had the, um, there was like a plainclothes division, the G-men, who were wandering around. And so they'd be tracing the, the movements and so on of volunteers. Then in the castle, in Dublin Castle, it Ned Broy as a double agent who was, um, copying all the files mm. that was held in the volunteers yeah. and who allowed Michael Collins in to Dublin Castle overnight to go through all the files they had to see what they had on them all mm. so this idea of like intelligence and counterintelligence and spying and who's who and who's defecting and who and being unable as well to engage in this open warfare but to have to have this clandestine kind of um, approach playing itself out across parts of the city that we all know like, yeah, it's just exactly. we all recognize crazy it. Yeah. crazy um, what's what else? What's the next kind of part that you, piece that you wanted to to go through? I wish in a way that I kept somebody else because you just led straight into what they talked about. But um, I thought we'd finish up this kind of um, segment. A segment on preparing for war and kind of the actions they took to. Um, but to train, how did they how did they even train? Like again, you can't just be out a load of lads in the field. You know what are you doing marching up and down the lines? Like how, you know, how did they do that? Yeah. So this is what Frank Sherwin talks about. Um, again, he's recorded by Gerard Brady, um, in nineteen eighty. But he talks about some of the um training practices of the IRA, hmm. um, and his own training as a signaler. So he says he doesn't. They didn't actually use much of that in the end. Okay. Um, what type of training would you have in the FIN or the IRA? Would you practice regularly, or would it be a set well, training? During during the whole period of the of the of the Tan War, we we go through army foot drill, you know, and uh, rifle drill, you know, and uh, we we'd be lectured on the mechanism of guns and one thing like that. And of course, I was a signaler during the the. the Civil, during that War of Independence period, I was attached to the IRA signal class. And uh, I was a signaler at, at, at all times, yes. What would a signaler do? Well, signal, a signaler practices signaling. The, the semaphore would fly out the hands and the, the flags and, and the buzzer. We'd, we'd practice always to give information. Well, out in the field, uh, you give information with flashing lamps or one thing or the other. Actually, very little of that was required, but we practiced it just in case, just the same. Um, for guns and that, do you know where you'd um, get your supply of guns from? Or if you need one when we're going out in a raid, would you have your own one or be given it by someone an ammunition? On it? Well, there wasn't a whole lot of guns. And of course, not every not everyone was active. You see, there was only small squads active, and very often we handed one another the same gun. Uh, the Fina had a small supply. When I was arrested, I was I I had five revolvers in in Patrick Street, and a whole lot of assorted ammunition. So yeah, I suppose you just get the impression of this, like like I was saying, this clandestine network trying to operate kind of in plain sight but hidden in plain sight exactly um, yeah. and to try and amass these forces and then these small squads that carry out these sudden strikes sudden raids where they're stealing weapons of, of yeah. British forces weapons of crown forces and using their own weapons against them exactly Pretty and this is yeah. something that was that was I mean that wasn't just taking part in Dublin like there was a huge huge amounts of engagements especially in Munster and Kerry and in Cork mm. um, during the War of Independence and I think you have a piece 
yes. that, that describes that. So this is our, we're going to hop out of Dublin for a second. Um, and it's really great actually that we have this piece because we're going to hear from uh, Covenant Horgan, who was um, at the time of the word in, of independence, he lived in Cork City, but by the time of the, the Urban Folklore Project, uh, in 1979, 1980, he's the proprietor of the Lansdowne Hotel on Pembroke Road. So it's, it's wonderful that we have him because we have then a, a small insight into somewhere else outside of the city. But he's a fascinating person. Mm. I could have included so much of, interv- of his interview, his interview is fantastic, if, yeah. um, if I wanted to. So he was, he was quite young at the, at the time of the, the War of Independence. He joined Nafiana, which were a younger kind of Boy Scouts, mm-hmm. essentially, but they often fed into the IRA mm-hmm. um, later. So he joined Nafiana in 1918 at 11 years of age, which would make him only, he's 11, 12, 13, maybe around during the years of the word of independence. But his, his whole family were involved in the rep- Republican movement of, in some way or another, and two of his older brothers were um, members of the IRA. Mm. The interview includes so many interesting things so um he talks about how uh, as a teenager he was caught out after curfew and whipped by the the black and tans mm. um he was saved from execution by uh, an ric officer um uh, i can't it's been a while since i've heard that clip but i believe they either mistook him from one of one of his older brothers but um in this clip he, I mean, he talks about the burning of Cork and how his, some of his house was uh, burnt in uh, on that night as well. Mm. It's it's worth noting as well when you're mentioning the black and tans, or and, and you hear, or if you hear reference to the augsies and so for people mm. who don't know, this is kind of an auxiliary force who were who were brought in uh, to kind of to deal with the situation basically that was unfolding. And who have entered into Irish consciousness, I guess, in total infamy and hatred, I think it's fair to say, exactly. in popular tradition, as a force who either killed civilians or engaged in, say, reprisals for raids against themselves or the Royal Irish Constabulary by attacking civilians or burning their homes or burning towns like Balbriggan and Cork yeah, and things like this. Exactly. Um, so they're, they're much despised, I think, and they, they're, they've entered a certain kind of, they hold a certain resonance or place in the Irish psyche even in the context of this episode I was, I was saying to you before we started recording I was going to pick out some songs maybe to play uh, to deal with this part of the mm-hmm. this phase of Irish history and decided against it actually because yeah. they're so um, kind of just I suppose they just reflect the strength of emotion and opinion yeah. about that period in particular and I thought I will refrain but it just, I guess, it what what that shows even is just the strength of force and the kind of the fear and the sense of dread and how they were despised mm-hmm. by the populace often. Yes. Um, but in this description, you have a description of the burning of, of the city of Cork was was yeah burnt um, as a reprisal. Yes, exactly. By the black and tan. So here's Commandant Horgan. During the burning of Cork, we were burned now too. They burned a whole lot of. Um, uh, they burned an awful lot of places but funny enough the thing that uh, annoyed us more um, than anything else annoyed me and annoyed my brother Ned um, was a, an old genet which had been tied a white genet that we had all had learned to, to ride on you know was tied in the stable and when it went on fire the poor thing was burned to death and the tans on another occasion they shot uh, a Grand Airedale dog that we had, you know, and you know, they funny how little things like your that. House was marked out by them. Oh, it was marked out by them, yes. And My father know. was on a on a raid, who was a peaceful man, really. Mm. My mother was, and she, I suppose, she had taken on some of the genes from from her from her father. Mm. You know, she was tough, but she had a rather dreadful time because she, uh, you know, we were raided every night, like more of most of the cock. I was at that time anybody in the national movement were raided. Indeed, some suffered even more than we did, you know. Mm. But um, it, it was, uh, I suppose, interrupted 
quite a bit. Where was your house now? Exactly? In Glashine Road. And it was burnt out the night. Uh, the car well, burnt it, out. It, it wasn't completely burned it out, burnt out, but the whole stables around it and part of it was burned. The actual night of the famous. The night burning. of the cork burning. Yeah. And were there many other uh, sort of Republican houses burnt? There were same? quite a number of houses yeah. burned out that night. So it wasn't just uh, Patrick Street and the, the city hall. Oh no, there were there were several other places. And if, you know, uh, raids started everywhere, you know, because, as you know, the black and tans and the Oxies went mad that night. They were all pretty well, well, I'd say, drunk. They must have been, because they'd, that was a dreadful thing, the burning of Cork. Was like the burning of Bal- Balbriggan. The same type of mentality of the people who did that in Balbriggan, uh, we had them in Cork, you know. Do you remember that night? Uh, uh, I do. Oh, I remember that night all right because that was the night that they, my my father uh, was trying to protect my sisters. Uh, well, the bedroom when when we were raided, and they came in, and um, at that time too, by the way, in Cork, you had to have the names of all the occupants on the back of the door, and if anybody was missing, you had to say where he was, and of course. And my brother Ned was missing most of the time, and my eldest brother Jim was missing too. Uh, and my brother, my father, when they came to the house, he he tried to protect my sisters, give them a chance of getting up and putting some clothes on them. And they threw him down the stairs. And uh, he was an oldish man at that time, you know. Uh, he was very badly injured. His knee was. He was a cripple for a hell of a long time afterwards as a result of that. I thought it was fascinating where he describes that you had to have the list of names on the mm. back of the front door of the house so that if you were raided or if, if somebody called, if some of the forces called in, that you had to be able to account for everybody in the house. And exactly. if somebody was missing, you had to be able to account for their whereabouts. Explain where they were. Explain where the hell they were, mm. which is kind of a slightly chilling thing. Yeah, so there's... Um, but anyway, in that section, I suppose, Common and Horgan gives a certain sense of the actions of, of the Black and Tans and how they were, you know, popularly regarded. Exactly. And um, it's a good transition because the next couple of, of pieces are going to speak about the Black and Tans and some of them are, I think up until now, we've, we've only heard from people who were involved in military action directly. But um, obviously the Black and Tans, uh, they had such an effect on... Civilian, civilian populations as well so it's good to have a mix of people speaking about them so we'll go to julia morden first so uh, she's fantastic i think i really she love yeah, yeah. listening to julia morden um she was from um stella gardens in ring's end and what i love about you won't hear this part in the recording but the full interview that she does it begins with um the collector and uh, the other people who are clearly in the room encouraging her to tell ghost stories first. So she she does tell a couple of ghost stories about figures who are seen in Ring's End, mm. but um, I think her narrative talent then does also lend itself to her own kind Personal of memories. reminiscences. Exactly. So yes, she talks about two incidents involving the Black and Tans. One she remembers herself and one uh, of a close uh, family member. But this night we were all in bed. And the next, the door was bet down with the butts of rifles. Yeah. The bastard got who would that be? Black and tans. I often told them about it. We did a lovely lot of hens. They let the hens out, searched the hen house. They searched every part of the place. Mm. Could find nothing. So my father said, you're, you're frightening the life out of the poor hens. My dad says, if you don't go out of the way, he says, I'll frighten the life out of you. He threatened me, poor father. And my father, went to, he was tall, he went to go to bed and told me, mother, oh, Jack Butler, you do, they'll riddle you. But our place was told us on there with them. Were they here for long? Oh, here for a good while. Were they? But I can give you a better one about them. Go on then. It was... My niece's father-in-law. Go on, for God's sake, eat a biscuit. Was very fond of the beer. And Mrs. Burden had a son, 
served in the British Navy and she had a pension for him, poor Ned. <laughs> this night he was coming home, curfew, and they held him up under the arch. And he said, uh, Why is all running from one individual? And he stood that way in the alley. And he said, Well, I'll sing a little song for you. And they stood. He said, Sung that song. Where would the English army be if it wasn't for Paddy's land? What's that? They, Do you know the rest of the words of it? They say no Irish need apply, that's a thing that I can't understand. But where would the English army be if it wasn't for Paddy's land? And Mrs. Burton's down on her knees, the old, the old bastard, she was calling her for me poor pension will be stopped. I'll be hungry. But how endeavour, the officer was very nice. He said, come on me dear man before someone gets nasty with you. So there was a woman in the corner house and her and her husband, our children was in bed, knelt in that kitchen. Children was asleep upstairs. She knelt in her bed in the kitchen, her and her, said the rose, you were expecting to hear me be shot. Yeah, she's wonderful. And again, and then we come back to this idea of the, the British Army again, that this woman had a pension from the British Army. Mm. And she was like, don't interfere with it. I, I still need the money. Mm-hmm. Is there another piece that you, were, you, you wanted to play just while that was playing we, there? Yeah, we're rounding off kind of our segment about the Black and Tans here, but we thought we'd play um, a clip from Lieutenant Colonel Manners O'Connell Fitzsimon. He features on two things. So he's on the 1916 site, do have a look for him there. And then he's also in your, the podcast with... Um, oh, on World War One. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So he features there too. And he's fascinating, uh, really. But in this clip, um, when he was recorded, he was uh, a retired British Army officer. And he wasn't really... Um, he wasn't in Ireland for most of the period of the War of Independence. So mm. it's only... He speaks about kind of his one experience of the War of Independence from Anglo-Irish perspective. Exactly. Back and exactly. But it's interesting with him. He, he he in in this context of this Anglo-Irish background, but in the context of nineteen sixteen and the executions, he talked about the wicked stupidity of the English. Mm. In in as far as the executions are concerned, he was saying like you know, they should have just given these lads thrashing and let them out <laughs> kind of thing. But he has this hilarious kind of manner about him. But yeah, an interesting an interesting figure. You weren't stationed in Ireland at all during the Black and Tan? Uh, I'm t- I was d- d- posted to the depot in 1919 down in Burr. And the tour of, uh, at a depot was only 18 months. 18 months afterwards I went back to the battalion in Colchester. And all I know of interest about the Black and Tans is there is a, a set of bastards, the whole lot of them, shite hogs as we used to call them, a shite hawk is a form of vulture that lives on muck. You will find them in Egypt and India. And the black and are rather like that. All I know about them is that uh, before the depot closed, they closed them, they said they're so stupid to the English people. With all this rumpus going on, the depots of the Irish regiments were still at work. And Things were beginning to get hot up, hotted up in in um, Offaly and around that part of the world, but still they stayed on. And we did have to go out and do a couple of patrols, but out on bicycles, just to go on patrol. And Charlie Harmon, who was Colonel Harmon, who was commanding, he wasn't interested, it was all too silly. Anyway, one officer, a sergeant and ten men, after Ross came back, no proper order or anything like that. Quite disinterested. But afterwards, after I had gone, and just before the depots were closed and transferred to England, a troop or a crowd of black and tans arrived in Burr and started beating up the town. Uh, there was no telephone between the barracks and the police down there. But the old superintendent there put two of his men onto bicycles and sent them on a circuitous route 
round the back up to where Crinkle, well, Crinkle Village, where the barracks were, imploring um, Charlie Harmon to send some soldiers down and clear them out. Harmon didn't bother about that. He ducked, jumped into his car, took one man with him, went down, went straight to the police barracks. With the help of the police, they tracked down the fellow who was commanding this crowd uh, in the main street. Harmon said, he told who he was, How many men have you got here? The fellow told him, I don't know what it was, 10 or 20 or something like that. And Charlie Harmon said, I'll give you half an hour to get your men out of this town. I'm taking the evening train now up to the castle and I'm going to report you. And what's the name of your second in command? I heard this from Charlie afterward. So the fellow told him. He then came back to barracks sent a small patrol of men down, the corporal in charge, with a note in case they were stopped with the blackened hands. Anyway, they'd cleared off. Harmon went up to Dublin that night. Next morning he went to the police headquarters and to the commander-in-chief, our friend that I told you about before. And uh, the upshot of it was <coughs> that the commander of this force and his second in command were dismissed, at least they were sent back to England. But they didn't hadn't time to do any damage, and most of them were tight. And that's all I know about them anyway. Well, why, uh, what type of men joined the Black and Tans? I don't know. What was different between... Uh, an awful, an awful, I gather they were an awful lot of them were fellows who were discharged, couldn't get work. Another lot of them, they were discharged and unhappy. Uh, they were ready to do anything and untrained. Why were they different to the regular troops? More because they'd never had any training and discipline knocked into them. Having used the term shitehawk many times, I've never <laughs> been privy to a formal definition of it, uh, such as was given by Colonel Mars O'Connell. Fitz Simons there, total legend. Um, shitehawks, living in Egypt and India, apparently. Yeah. You heard a, a kind of muck-eating vulture. You heard it here first. Fascinating insight. And even again, the description of the, which I find, I don't know why it is, it's just something slightly chilling when he describes the, um, not just the kind of the state of the black and tans and so on, but the, his commanding officer is saying that he's going to get, he's getting the train up to the castle. Yeah. And the castle. image of the castle kind of always looms large in the mind at this period, which was the center of really administrative kind of mm. British rule and power in Ireland. It's kind of large like domineering kind of place where terrible things would have happened yes terrible terrible things would have happened. people being murdered and tortured and so on and being brought into the castle at all hours of the night so when i hear a reference kind of to the castle mm -hmm. and someone going up there and that's and you know in those corridors and so on it's quite um yeah it's quite chilling in a way um but that was colonel o'connell fitz simons what's the next piece what, what else we so have? now we'll go to a, a much younger person liam carey he he's speaking about his his family and their um, associations with the Republican movement. Well, I suppose I'll tell you about a couple of uncles. Uh, Jim Carrey is one of the Twelve Apostles, uh, the bodyguards of Michael Collins, handpicked for the cold-bloodedness. Um, I never found him cold-blooded. He was an extraordinarily kind man, very passive person, uh, really a nice man. Um, How do you mean he was handpicked? Who picked him? Michael Collins did. Mm. Um, he picked twelve during the Bloody Sunday in in. 1920, uh, I hope I got the dates correct, I probably haven't. They wiped out the uh, Coro Gang, which is the British Secret Service operatives who were operating in, in Dublin to uh, counter the Irish Republican Army presence. And uh, Collins picked a group of people to uh, go into boarding houses and wipe clean the colonels, lieutenants, captains, majors um, of British Army presence in our, in in the southern Ireland in Dublin, clean, which they duly did. Um, there's one particular case that's been written about. My uncle was involved in uh, in Baggett Street. He uh, went into a house and uh, they busted in the door. He told me this himself. And uh, the major was in bed with his wife, who was very very pregnant. 
and told him he was going to die and the uh, major said, well, please not in front of my wife. So they took him out into the hallway and uh, finished it. And uh, the wife's baby was born a week later, still born. It hung my uncle's mind for 15, 20 years. Eventually it uh, got to the stage where he tried to commit suicide and they locked him up in Grange Garment for 10 years. Um, with a private room and so on and so forth, which he, I'm sure, married. He used to escape on Easter and Christmas. They never found out how he ever escaped. And uh, he'd come up to my mother and my grandmother and uh, they hit him until eventually the guard would come around and want to take him back. But uh, that's Liam Carey and... And then it, it leads into another account from an older man who was who did actually take part in Bloody Sunday, which Liam Carey mentioned just there. Bloody Sunday was an event where the Black and Tans arrived at a, a match in Crow Park between Dublin and Tipperary. A Gaelic football match. A Gaelic football match. And proceeded to a right, shoot at the shoot crowd, the shoot crowd. at everybody. And this kind of awful, awful event was as a reprisal for the shooting of the Cairo gang that had taken place, I think, earlier that That's morning. That's as Liam Carey mentions, yeah. Exactly. A reprisal for their murder. So Patrick Galvin, this next speaker, is going to speak a little bit about the role of his battalion being on scout duty mm-hmm. uh, around the morning of Bloody the Sunday. events of Bloody Sunday. Uh, now, in, in our area, now in our area, it was mostly, it was done, of course, I mean, say, and that was... Uh, upper Mount Street. Yeah. It was mostly in Upper Mount Street, you see, they, they, those people, uh, those people uh, uh, were stopping, do you see? Mm. And it was uh, it was there, of course, I mean to say, that uh, uh, our battalion, the 3rd Battalion, of course, I mean to say, decided for to have a go at them, do you see? Of course, uh, the houses of which they were stopping, and of course, the, it was there that the, that they were all they were all, in other words, I suppose, murdered. See, well shot, they were. You see, now that started Bloody Sun. That was the, that was the, that was the starting of Bloody Sun that were. You see, so. Uh, was your battalion mixed up in their shooting? I thought oh, Collins yeah. had his own squad. And uh, uh, well, of course, I mean to say he was he was he was the commander. He was the man, of course, I mean to say, with regard to uh, to uh, to all those activities, you see, of course, during the black and tan and all, do you see? He was the man, do you see? Mm-hmm. When you seen him knocking about, of course, I mean to say, there was something, there was something doing, do you know? Mm-hmm. Yes, but uh, of course, he was the man, of course, that, uh, that issued the orders. Mm-hmm. Himself and uh, uh, G- General Mulcahy, mm-hmm. do you see? Now, they were the two principal men of the guerrilla warfare here in Ireland. I'd like to, I'd like to, it's, uh, I'd like to say that I would, uh, uh, of course, and uh, they were the men, of course, that gave the orders to see it uh, uh, through headquarters. You mm-hmm. see, so of course, I mean to say that uh, on this occasion, of course, uh, we uh, uh, they gave the orders, of course, I mean to say, to attack those people. You see, it was the only way, of course, I mean to say, the only weapon that we really could use. You see, of course, in our struggle at the time. Did you do so, that on Bloody Sunday yourself? You uh, I was, uh, I was out, uh, I was out rec- uh, on on scout duty. Mm. Well, that's what I was on on scout. You see, of course, we had to have scouts. Do you see, of course, do you see, to watch this one and that one. Do you see, of course, it was on a Sunday morning that the thing took place. Do you see. So, uh, of course, uh, I was out going around uh, do, uh, as a scout. Do you see, for to uh, to be able to to uh, get in touch with our people, do you see, if we seen any of those people there, such as the Tans or that, do you see, of course, uh, we, uh, uh, to get in touch then, of course, we say, with the men that was inside in the houses, do you see, of course, mm. doing their stuff. Mm. And uh, you weren't in Crow Park that evening, were you? Uh, no, no, yeah. do you see, of course, uh, we had, we, we did have an idea, you know, and we said that this thing was going to, uh, was going to, to, to clash. Do you see, with regard to uh, Tipperary and Dublin were played, do you see, uh, and on that particular day, do you see, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the, of course, the, we, we, of course, we had a, a, a good idea, do you see, do you see, so of course, I mean to say, it was, uh, we couldn't very well be in, we couldn't very well involve ourselves in it, you know, of course, because uh, these people were out for to, to, out to get revenge, do you see, for had it taken place on Sunday morning. So yeah, I mean, in that he's describing, I suppose, the context around 
the events of Bloody Sunday, which is just, again, something else that has entered into the Irish psyche in a kind of, in a particularly, um, it just stands out in sharp relief. I mean, you have, you know, British Army forces, the Black and Tans, conducting a kind of a raid on Crow Park on this football pitch, you get a football kind of pitch, and then unannouncedly kind of just firing into the crowd, start shooting into the crowd. They killed children, they killed just mm-hmm. men and women assembled, injured people, some fatally injured. Um, so again, it gives a sense of the, of the, I suppose, it's something that led to a certain outrage, shall we yeah, say, absolutely. In, in, the, in the popular consciousness. Um, that was Patrick Gavin. So this, the next man, Tommy O'Reilly, he, good piece to bring us to kind of towards the end of the, um, the episode because he speaks about how he was arrested and he was arrested and imprisoned in Dublin Castle until until the truce. Um, so bring us right towards the end. Okay. Right. No, before that, I had been called into GHQ. In so I was called into the Department of Finance. <clears throat> My father was in the Department of Finance. And uh, I was brought in. Collins was in charge. He was Minister for Finance. And I was brought in there, and I was to do <coughs> with Joe O'Reilly. Joe O'Reilly was a Cork chap. He was with Collins. And I went up to, I was sent up to O'Neill's and Pleasant Street. And they gave me a new bicycle. I remember it well. I got a new bicycle. <coughs> and I used to go do messages for Collins. Right. There was a jump on the Fibsborough Road. Right. And... Uh, you brought stuff there and you picked up stuff. It was a kind of a distributing office. Right. <clears throat> Any stuff marked for GI, that was Director of Intelligence. Collins was Minister of Finance, the Director of Intelligence. Right. right. Um. I, I, I'd, leave, I'd pick up his stuff and leave other stuff there for the Minister of Defence or wherever it might be, the QMG or wherever it might be. Mm. <clears throat> um. Did you, do you know what would be in those messages? No, they're sealed letters. Sealed letters. We never opened them. And, you know, when you were doing that job, would you keep that very private? Or oh, we had to. Yeah. I mean, there was curfew then, 8 o'clock, 7 o'clock at night, I think. Right. We were only out in the morning from 10 o'clock till 5. <coughs> then maybe in the evening, the company had a meeting on, I'd go down, I'd, I'd go down to the company meeting. Right. Right. The officers I was attached to was, <coughs> first it was in Mary Street, and then we went over to um, Andrew Street. Sahi O'Donoghue, George McGrath, Eamon Fleming, and there was two Miss Lyons's on it. Now, I met other people that told me they were in the finance, but I never met, I never met them in it. Mm. But they told me they were in the Department of Finance, but they could, they could have been. Yeah. <coughs> Would that have been around 19... 19, 19 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, I was with Collins. I was coming in with... I used to pick up papers in Angel Street. Uh, I can't think of him now. He was and he was in Kilmainham with me. I can't think of his name. He had a, he had a news agent shop and I used to pick up all the papers. <coughs> the English papers and Irish papers. They were for intelligence. And I used to bring them down and give them to Joe Riley. I used to meet Joe down in a place in Westland Row, a shop in Westland Row, around 10 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> Where I was coming down Grafton Street after picking up my papers in Angel Street. Mm. When I heard hot, I didn't see them on the path. On the path. Mm. <clears throat> they just picked me out. On the bicycle. <clears throat> so I went around the bicycle. I made a drive. Of, uh, I went around the car. I don't know. The one up at the top, which is Duke Street or Anne Street. The one nearest the green. Um, around that one I went. Anne Street. I went down Anne Street and turned around to Malthor Street. <clears throat> Just got down to Dare Street. I was heading for the back of the Trinity College, went to the railings on my bicycle. Right. And I went into a, an, army, an army foot patrol. And I got a dig of a rifle and was put flying. I would have got away only for that. Do you think they knew that you were being chased? Well, I think they did because they they came to me immediately were auxiliaries and civilians. 
they arrived on the scene when the other fellas had me because they followed me in the car, in a private car, <coughs> and they searched me, the military searched me and found nothing. The other searched me, we had a, a sl you know how you had the vents in the back yeah, of your, yeah. we had a little pocket stuck in there, and I had a letter there from Mick to Dick. And Mick to Dick was it. <laughs> so I brought over to the intelligence of the castle. King, he was the chief man in the castle. And I think it was the 7th of July, the 6th or something, early in July and all that. But I know <clears throat> I was left, I was kept in the dungeons, number three dungeon in the castle. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I was the last prisoner in the dungeons in the castle. I was, the la I was there till two weeks after the truce. <clears throat> and I was there and I'd be brought up every day up to the intelligence and getting threatened here and threatened there and cracks here and cracks there. So, um, I said I knew nothing. I didn't know. I was only picking up a letter. <clears throat> and I told them I was leaving it in the lavatory in Westland Row. I said I was going to put it at the back of the cylinder, I said. <clears throat> That's why I... And I kept to that. Whether they believe me or not, I don't know. But I got the works for a long time, for the, for, for the, until, until, the, until the morning of the truth. An amazing account. Like, it's crazy when you hear him saying, like, you know, cycling down Molesworth Street, mm. heading on to Kildare Street, um, down towards the, the Raylands of Trinity, and then being stopped by this military patrol and dragged in by, up by the Black and Tans and into the dungeons of Dublin Castle. But, like, when you're, you hear reference to these streets, yeah. you, we know these places. We yeah. walk up and down these places with our friends. All, all, all the all time, the like time. exactly, and to suddenly see, or to hear, I suppose, you know, who else has been on those streets not long ago, within kind of um, just out of living memory, essentially, exactly, um, is just slightly astounding. You have these accounts of, I was going to say, ordinary people wrapped up doing extraordinary things, but they kind mm. of are extraordinary, extraordinary people. Just their men and women, their their bravery and courage and tenacity and ability to to kind of maintain these networks, hidden networks and systems, yeah. underground networks and systems of intelligence and, and counterintelligence and guerrilla warfare and so on, all across the city and around the country. Um, it's amazing work that you've done. This sort of material as well is really useful, I think, in providing just a kind of three-dimensional sometimes overview as a supplementary kind of account, or accounts that stand in their own right. But, but for anyone who is interested, particularly in kind of the cut and dry details of maybe military history and, or, or history in general, in a more formal sense, mm -hmm. these kinds of records always bring a particular flavour and a colour to the descriptions of historical events. Often even just in how, how, what they reveal about the popular perception and, yeah. and opinions about, about these kind of events. I was chatting to some... School of History students here at the university recently, some master's students about archives and so on, and um, somebody had asked, well, how, how do you kind of assess the truth? How do you assess the truth of, the of say, the folkloric record or of oral history records? Hmm. And what I was saying to, to the student in that case, it's a good question, but that we're not, as folklorists, specifically interested necessarily in the truth or falsity of what's being described, but no. in what it reveals around the ideas around popular opinion and perceptions and belief and so on exactly and the patterns that emerge in that regard different i suppose if you're looking then at more communal observances and kind of narratives that crop up and motifs again and again but it's just fascinating to have these accounts and to see all the work that you've done and um, you're going to be giving a lecture with our director christor mccorrig dr christor mccorrig for the folklore of Ireland society exactly so any details about about that um it will take place on the 6th of December at 6 o'clock on Zoom. So keep an eye out on social media. Um, we'll put a link out to that, yeah. And, yeah. and people can people be free to I think you attend. can, yeah, register for the webinar. You can register and then uh, attend. You'll hear some of the, the, the same clips again, but some some might differ as well. Great. And um, I suppose just to say as well, this is, will be the last episode before we sign off for Christmas. So we'll see people in the new year. So um, yes, Merry Christmas, God you, Yo Saturnalia, Nalakana, Agus, yeah, Bemidarash. Ah, um, so yeah, to finish, I suppose it brings us up to the brink of civil war. But the signing of the treaty, we kind of enter a new phase of conflict with the the onset, the establishment of the civil war, which is another fascinating topic. I mean, the opening shots of the civil war. Um, were the destruction of the Public Records Office of Ireland, yeah. the National Archive, was destroyed and <laughs> raised to the ground. 
that was that was the beginning of the civil war which in ways was a kind of a more bitter conflict than than the, the war mm. of independence that had preceded it uh, and again even the fault lines in kind of the modern political context of the major political parties are still divided along the lines of the civil war yeah exactly. um and even collins himself in signing it the, mm. the young lawyers treaty um that we're kind of that is, we're now coming to the 100 year anniversary of uh, said of it that he thinks he's signed his own death warrant which and he did was, he, yeah, by august of 1922 he, he had been shot and killed in, in the civil war he was killed in, in cork and mm-hmm. um, so i suppose it like i said to thank you again for the, the research that you've done and publishing it and bringing it out it's a fantastic collection oh, to return to to um to return to cork you have a last piece that you want to play to finish with Commandant Horgan. Yeah, it's quite a poignant piece to finish on. So he, he speaks about his own mother and how it was an especially troubling time for her um, when everybody who was involved in IRA activity was ex- excommunicated by the church in Cork. Um, and he describes when a pastoral letter was read out in mass, everyone in his own uh, family stood up and left, apart from his own mother. My mother ran the whole shoot, you know. She was a real vanity, and she really ran the whole thing. Yeah. She was a wonderful woman, yeah. wonderful woman. And that was, tri- that was why she suffered so much again, because she suffered during the Black and Tan period with the raids and what have you. But she suffered also in our relations, uh, in her, she was a very holy woman. I can still remember my mother taking me up to ways to talk, devotions kind of thing, you know. No matter where I did, where I was, I had to be there ready for that. And when our famous Dr. Colin excommunicated us in Cork, and we were the only place, that was the only place where we were excommunicated, uh, and this pastoral letter was written out, was read out on the Mass, those of us who were in the IRA, including my family, all my family practically, I think one sister stayed with my mother. We got up and walked out of the church, you know. Well, this was was desperate to her because she was, she was very closely related to the to the priests, especially a priest by the name of Father O'Toole, who was a, one of our well, he used to visit us very often, and this was the heartbreak that mothers went through, went through, went through, went through.